I taught U.S. history at the university level for a better part of 40 years. And one of the things I learned encountering over a thousand students was that one of the fundamental problems they had was they did not understand the differences between Republican and Democratic forms of government. That's what I want to talk about in this video. I'm sorry to say that when I used to ask them early in the class what the difference between these two forms were, the most frequently heard answer I would get would be, well, if a Republican is president, it's a Republican form of government. If a Democrat's president, it's a Democratic form of government. That's really what they used to tell me. Other than that, most of them really didn't have a clue. In an effort to explain it to them, I would use a hypothetical involving slavery, which was usually something that came out of the schools with knowing something about. So I present them with this hypothetical. In this hypothetical, it's 1859. James Buchanan, a Democrat, is president of the United States, the only president we've ever had from Pennsylvania, my home state, and one of the worst presidents we had in history. Buchanan basically fiddled as the country headed toward civil war. But in my hypothetical, Buchanan decides to take action. In my hypothetical, Buchanan decides to employ a concept that the Democrats were using at the time, popular sovereignty, the idea of leaving questions related to slavery to the individual states and the people in those states to decide. And in my hypothetical, Buchanan decides to hold a national plebiscite, a national poll, a national vote about slavery. And the question is simple. Should slavery continue in the United States where it exists, basically in the South, or should slavery be eliminated where it exists, primarily in the South? That's the question. And in my hypothetical, Buchanan decides to let everybody over the age of 21 vote including women, and including slaves. And the way they're going to do that is have a simple ballot with little pictures on it of a, one guy you know, with, with his, his hands shackled and another guy with his hands raised in prayer or jubilation or whatever, so that even the slaves can figure out what they want. And in my hypothetical, purely hypothetical, I'm not saying this was likely, this would never have happened, but let's just say it did. And in my hypothetical, everything goes well, it's a free vote. There are, you know, judges there watching to make sure that there's no shenanigans going on. And they hold the vote. And it goes well. And they get the results. So the results come in. And it turns out that about 50.6% of the people who voted voted to continue slavery. And the rest voted against it. Now, that outcome is not inconceivable. You have to remember, in the election of 1860, the Republicans around Lincoln. Lincoln was not a candidate of abolition. Lincoln and the Republicans, while contained abolitionists in the party, the Republican Party was against the primarily the extension of slavery into the territories. It wasn't about abolition at that point. So it's entirely possible that a majority of the people in the country would have voted to continue slavery in the South. Remember, Lincoln only got 40% of the popular vote. 60% of the people in the country voted against Lincoln, who was the candidate of the party of containment of slavery. So it's not inconceivable that it had been, been a vote, even if they let the four plus million African American slaves vote, the proposition still would have lost. It's entirely conceivable. We'll never know because it never happened. But the question I then ask the students is, if a majority of Americans, including African Americans, in the vote had offered a majority for the proposition that slavery should continue, would you have been satisfied with that? If you were a, a white person up north and an abolitionist, would you have said, well, what was it the Romans said? Vox populi, vox dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God. I guess, you know, we'll just have to live with slavery. Or if you were an African slave in the South, would you have said, geez, the people have spoken. I just, I'm just going to have to continue the rest of my life as a slave. My guess is no. 
you would still think that despite the vote, despite the fact that a majority of the people supported the idea of continuation of slavery in the South, it was wrong. Why? Because you believed that slavery was wrong. That's why you would take that position. Slavery is immoral. Slavery is against your philosophy, against your religion, against whatever. But slavery is a moral wrong. I don't care that over 50% of the people want to continue it. It's wrong. And that is the point where I can explain to the students the difference between democracy as a form of government and Republican forms of government, because that's what it's really all about. It's about freedom and it's about slavery. Those are the alternatives. Freedom in a Republican form, democratic forms, and slavery. The word democracy comes from the Greek demos, meaning the people, the, the people rule, the people make the decisions. The people are sovereign and they decide what should happen in government. The word republic, on the other hand, comes from the Romans, from the Latin, res publica, a thing of the public or a public thing. The Romans, like the Greeks, believed that the people themselves were sovereign, but they had a different approach to government that separation of powers in some ways that Greek democracy lacked. And through the Enlightenment, that had been changed and further developed in the West. By the time you get to the Americans, they're thinking in these terms that people are born or created with rights, created as it says in the Declaration of Independence, and that governments are instituted among men to protect those rights. That's what the Declaration says. Government isn't instituted to do the will of the majority. Government is instituted to protect the rights of the people. If you're a person, you can be strong, but there's always three or four people who will come and take your property, take your life, or take your liberty. They may enslave you. So you form government with your fellow citizens to protect your rights and to protect their rights. It's a social contract. That's what it's all about. But the primary duty of a Republican government isn't to do the will of the majority. It's to protect the rights of individual people. And one of the common criticisms of American government, and you can hear this in the media, you can find it in history books, and I certainly heard it from my students, was that the government as founded was essentially undemocratic. And that's absolutely true. But it wasn't undemocratic because they were trying to throttle the people. It was undemocratic because they were trying to protect the rights of the people. It was undemocratic by design. They weren't Democrats, small d Democrats. They were Republicans. And they were trying to create a republic. And you can see the undemocratic nature of the republic in many of its forms, which are consistently criticized today. You have the Senate. Each state gets two senators, no matter how many people it has. That's undemocratic. You have the election of a president, not by popular vote, but by an electoral college. Again, undemocratic. If you think about it, even the Supreme Court is undemocratic. Who elects Supreme Court justices or any of the other justices at the federal bench? Nobody gets to vote for them, and they're in there for life. That's entirely undemocratic. But that was by design. They were trying to get a government that wasn't geared to doing whatever the majority wanted done at the moment, but would pose a break on the government to protect the government from becoming tyrannical, threatening the rights of the people, not just the majority, but the rights of, especially of the minorities. In many ways, that's what slavery was all about. Blacks were 20% of the population in the country, and they were enslaved. Why were they enslaved? Because they were 20% of the population, and the majority, especially in the South, wanted to keep them enslaved. Democracy is something you require for slavery. If the founders had wanted to establish a true, true democracy, there would have been no Senate. There would have been no courts. You just would have had the House of Representatives, and you'd have a president who was elected not by the Electoral College, not by even popular vote. You could just elect him right out of whoever the House of Representatives wants as, as their executive officer. That's the way they used to do it under the Confederation. The president came out of the Congress. You could do it that way. It would be an entirely democratic system. But that's not what they wanted. 
because they were afraid of what a system like that would do, especially if you start giving it more powers than they had had under the Articles of Confederation. Do you really want a stronger central authority that could threaten people, that could become in itself tyrannical? The founders were students of history and political theory. There were, in their minds, three forms of government. Monarchy, aristocracy, sometimes called oligarchy, and then you had democracy. The problem was, all three forms could become tyrannical. We didn't revolt against King George III because he was a monarch. We had been living under monarchs, British monarchs, English monarchs, since the early 1600s, without issue. Why George III? Because in the American view, he had become a tyrant. We were rebelling against tyranny. They knew, historically, monarchs could become tyrannical. It's not a rare occurrence. They knew that aristocracies could become tyrannical. And they knew that democracies could become tyrannical. And in many ways, the tyranny of a democracy is the worst to deal with. If you have a monarch, you need one bullet. In aristocracy, you need several bullets. But what do you do with the tyranny of the majority? What do you do if 55, 60% of the people are behind the tyranny? That's the issue that the slaves faced in the United States. They were 20% of the population being tyrannized by the other 80%. What can they do? Can they rise up and revolt? The Americans could revolt against a tyrannical monarch, because he was on the other side of the ocean. The slaves in San Domingo, when they rebelled in the 1790s, were 98% of the population. They could get rid of the French white aristocracy that controlled the island and kept them enslaved. But American slaves, 20% of a population, are facing the tyranny of a majority. Democracy, if you will. And they were stuck. They were stuck until the majority itself decided that slavery needed to be eliminated, not just what they wanted, but what the rest of the population wanted. That's when slavery finally ended. The Democrat Party formed in the late 1790s. It's the first real election you could see it in is the election of 1800. At the time, they didn't call themselves the Democrat or Democratic Party. They called themselves the Republican Party. Their leader was Thomas Jefferson, who considered himself personally a Republican. He actually said once something to the effect that the only government that isn't always at war with the people and the protection of their rights is Republican government. In that sense, he was not a Democrat, and he didn't call his party the Democrat Party. How did it become known as that? When did the name change? It didn't change until the 1820s during the split in within the Democratic Party, between the John Quincy Adam wing, which became known as the National Republicans, and the Andrew Jackson wing, which became known as the Democratic Republicans. And then eventually, the Jackson wing won, and they dropped the Republican and went with the term Democrats. It was a basically a marketing effort to make themselves look more popular and to get more votes. But it, in many ways, they were going back on the principles of Republicanism that had rested with the founding of the party by Thomas Jefferson. And what is one of the first things that happens in the United States when this new party finds itself in power under Jackson? We've already had slavery, and the Democrat Party, newly formed, is becoming the protector of slavery in the South. And it's under Jackson that the Democrats, who have a majority in both houses and basically run the government from top to bottom, pass the Indian Removal Act and move all the Native Americans that they can get their hands on from east of the Mississippi to west of the Mississippi, including infamously the Cherokee, the Trail of Tears, and all that administrative disaster that was carried out by the federal government. One of the biggest stains on American history, second only to slavery. That's democracy in action. There was no break. The Supreme Court could do very little to stop it because it had no enforcement power because the rest of the entire government was under control of this new group of Democrats, self-styled Democrats. I often see people on television, in books, students, 
tell me that, you know, one of the biggest protections we have for our democracy in this country is the Bill of Rights. That's, that's exactly wrong. The Bill of Rights isn't a protection of democracy. It's a protection of our rights from democracy. The Bill of Rights says what you cannot do, what the government cannot do. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. It doesn't say unless 51% of the people want to do that. You know, they can't make laws against restricting freedom of speech. But it doesn't say unless 51% of the people want to do that. It doesn't matter what percentage of the people. If, if the majority of the people in this country, 60% voted to shut down the New York Times, would that make it right? No, because they would have First Amendment protections, as well they should. If you don't have a First Amendment, then if 51% of the people want to shut down Fox News or Washington Post or the New York Times or Time Magazine, does anybody read Time Magazine anymore anyway? Probably not. But you get my point. That would be pure democracy. Do you really want that? Do you want the majority of the people in this country to be able to shut things down? You know, what if Hitler had held a plebiscite in Germany and asked the German people, would you like me to exterminate all the Jews in Germany? And 52% of the people said yes. Would that have made the Holocaust okay? No, we shouldn't have a Holocaust memorial because 52% of the people in Germany wanted to get rid of all the Jews. So that would make it all right? I mean, unless you're willing to say that, you ought not to claim that you're a Democrat. I don't mean member of a Democratic Party. I just mean small d Democrat. Because the logic of democracy is that if 51% of the people wanted to wipe out the Jews or enslave all the blacks, you should be for it. It should be okay. Morality isn't based on something separate from what happens. It's based on what 51% of the people want. And if 51% of the people today want to enslave blacks, that would be okay. I don't think so. I would consider it wrong, but then I'm a Republican. I believe that people have rights first and government is formed to protect those rights, not to carry out the will of the majority. And that's the difference between Republican and Democratic government, simply put. The founders understood that government was a necessary evil. Government was dangerous. Government, no matter its form, could become tyrannical. But the form of government that lent itself most to tyranny was pure democracy. Democracy, 51%, majority rule, minorities are screwed. It's that simple. Even within our Republican form of government, during World War II, you had the Democrats running everything. They had picked the Supreme Court justices to have a majority. You had a House they controlled. You had the Senate they controlled. And they controlled uh, the presidency, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. They had the closest we'd come to an overwhelming democratic control of government. And what did they do? They rounded up Japanese Americans and put them in camps. You know, FDR did it. Senate didn't balk at it. House didn't balk at it. Supreme Court heard a case and actually ruled for the government. And these people were, were stuck in their camps. Today, we recognize it as a great injustice. We've apologized, we've offered some reparations. It's the, the third big blind spot, sorry spot in American history alongside the Indian Removal Act and slavery. But it's democracy in action. When you have one party controlling everything from top to bottom, including the court, and, you can, and the will of the majority is such, after Pearl Harbor, it wasn't a lot of sympathy for uh, Japanese and Japanese Americans, you could very easily put them in camps. Fortunately, in this country, we didn't do more. Like they did in places in Europe or even places in Asia at the same time. We were you know, relatively con constrained, at least in that sense. But again, this is the problem with democracy. It lends itself to tyranny. And of course, what we're seeing today is the Democrat Party, in an effort to gain power, trying to undermine these institutions of Republican government. And I would argue what they're doing is trying to prepare the way for a democracy controlled by them, where people's rights will be disappearing. 
until they're ultimately all gone. They're already challenging the First Amendment with speech, with regard to uh, religion. They're going after the Second Amendment. They're going after many amendments. They don't like the Senate. They don't like the Electoral College. They want to make the government more democratic, more prone to the excesses we've seen when you have one party control in government. Just ask Japanese Americans, ask Cherokee, ask African Americans. Those are the dangers. That's the difference between a Republican form of government and a Democratic form of government. If you got something out of this video, please let me know in a comment, uh, subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up, hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos, uh, share this one with your friends, and until the next time, I'm out of here.